To Rebelpreneur Radio, helping you break the rules and build the business you need for the life you want. And now, broadcasting his pirate signal from somewhere beyond the status quo. Here's your host, best selling author, marketing and media strategist, Ralph Brogdon. Hello, and welcome to Rebelpreneur Radio, the show that helps you build the business you need so you can live the life you want. I am Ralph Brogdon. I remember a commercial that came on television a few years ago. I think it was Sally Struthers. And she would come on and with her little high pitched voice say, do you want to make more money? Sure, we all do. So isn't that true? And it's probably just as true today as it was then. Don't you want to make money? Yeah, absolutely. We all want to make money. The question is, how do we go about it and how do we do that? Especially if we're going to build a business, we need to live the life that we want How do we do that? And how do we make money and make a difference? Today's guest is going to show us how to make money as an influencer in today's new content crazy world. I'm speaking with Heather Ann Havenwood. She is the founder of Influencer Growth Formula. She's a top Amazon bookseller from her for her book, Sexy Boss, nationally syndicated radio host of the show Like a Boss Insights with Influencers. And she's named by Huffington Post. As top female entrepreneur to watch, she is the founder of Female Business Association, and she's known as the Chief Sexy Boss. We're really uh, fortunate to have her. Heather Ann Havenwood, welcome to Rebelpreneur Radio. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that very much. You help brands and businesses as well as influencers on figuring out the best strategies. So I love Mm -hmm. that because I'm a strategist as well. Do you help them mm-hmm. to dominate their industry by being omnipresent online? Mm-hmm. You do this with strategic content marketing, high ticket sales strategies to close the right clients anytime they want. That sounds very intriguing. Um, you're also regarded as a top authority on podcast marketing, influencer messaging and high ticket sales closing, leveraging LinkedIn. So you are really, really connected and you've got a lot of experience and expertise before we get into how you do it and how we might be able to duplicate that success. How did you get interested in this area? What got you started in business? Thanks for having me. So that's a great question. People ask me all the time. Um, It's not what people think. Um, Some people have a great story of they've chosen it and they stepped out of corporate America. I got fired from corporate America. (laughs) They kicked me out. (laughs) They were more like, you're not good here. Please leave. Um, So I have an entire story about that. And then I actually tried to go back to corporate America. I thought, well, um, you know, they're wrong. I should probably go back to corporate America. And I lasted 90 days. That was in like 2013. <laughs> and I never so forget the, it. It was what's the problem? How, how come you're how come you're not a good fit for corporate America? Well, I'll never forget it. It's a great it's a great question. Uh, my boss and my boss's boss, like a like, tag team, they came in the office and they said, Heather, we like you. You're you know, you're doing well in the world of like your job, uh, but you don't fit here. You're too much of an <laughs> entrepreneur you need to go. <laughs> that was their exact. And I just kind of looked at him like, really? They're like, yeah, you don't like, you need to be an entrepreneur in a weird way. It was a compliment, right there. You yeah. know? Um, yeah, I don't fit in the structure. And then one of the things about that is, you know, the corporate America, it is what it is, but they have rules. Like this is, this is your job and this is your rules. And this is your lane. I don't like lanes. I would say things like that's ridiculous. Why are you guys doing that? That's not efficient. You guys need to go to this level. And they would go, um, that's not your role to, to say that. And I'm like, <laughs> but why not? You know? So that's kind of how it went. Um, that was back in 2013. But the first time I got kicked out in corporate America was in 2001, right after September 11, they kicked me out. So I went back <laughs> <laughs> 13 years later and they kicked me out again after 90 days. Yeah. So that's kind of how I got the business. But I, I actually ended up starting doing uh, seminars, traveling the country, doing seminar sales, cop- like basically going to city to city to city, walking into a room of, of, of strangers. And within 90 minutes, I had to extract $3,000 out of their hand or I wouldn't eat that night. So it was either Ruth oh. Chris or ramen noodles, right? So I learned <laughs> the art of sales and copywriting and direct response marketing from 2001 to 2007. Uh, when I traveled the country, did about 400 uh, events and seminars in that time frame. 
Wow. And and what were you selling in these seminars? Oh, you don't remember? It's, um, you know, how to make money with real estate and how to flip oh. houses. And oh. like that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I was in Florida during the whole, you know, uh, real estate boom and bust. And mm-hmm. bust. I was definitely there for the bust, but I was definitely there for the boom where people were just basically, are you breathing? Where's the social security number? Here's a house, you know? Yeah. So um, <laughs> we were doing the short sales and the foreclosures and the flippers and the flipping and the, I mean, I was in all of that. Um, so I taught people how to buy and sell houses and did it myself. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I yeah. remember the movie, the short, I don't remember people remember that movie, the short, which is about the 2008 hit. And I remember being in the movie theater and going, I remember that day. I remember that day. I remember that day. I remember that moment. You know, I pretty much lived that movie. So yeah. that was what I did. Now, now, shortly before all of, all of the, the big real estate uh, bust, yeah. in 2006, you started an online information marketing yes. and publishing company. And it's very interesting because you went from zero to over a million in sales in less yes. than 12 months uh, with, with no list. A product, a name, or an offer. So how did you do that? So um, I was in the real estate industry, and I had a gentleman come up to me who, who knew how to buy and sell houses. He was very good at it, but he didn't know how to do the education side. There's two worlds in, in that world. There's the how do you buy and sell a house, you know, and then there's the education real estate side. And I was in the education side. And so he came to me and said, I don't know how to do these events and seminars and books and CDs and tapes and all this stuff. And so um, I said, okay, so we basically went from zero. He was a nobody to a million in sales in 12 months. That business is still viable today. He's still around as a speaker and educator in the real estate space. However, what I did wrong and why from zero to a million dollars of bankruptcy is that he's not necessarily the best person on the planet. And he (laughs) came home one day from an event and he took all the money and stole the money and emptied all the bank accounts and reversed the merchant accounts and things like that. So, uh, he wanted the money for himself and he took it (laughs) clearly. And it was bad timing for me because it was a right, uh, it was like on that cusp, right? I was in, in central Florida. So I was on that cusp. So I tried to, um, you know, do some things with the house and people for the house to get money quickly. And it, the house was upside down already from the, from the hit. Hmm. So, um, yeah, that's, that's why my house went to foreclosure within 60 days and then bankruptcy within six months. And then after that, everyone, like all my friends were in bankruptcy at the time. It was like a bankruptcy party after that, but mine <laughs> was not triggered by the recession. It was triggered, uh, by a bad business deal. Wow. Well, wow. so you have yeah. gone on from there to, to really figure out the best strategies for making money as an influencer yeah. and, and really leveraging that information, not doing it uh, necessarily face to face, not necessarily yeah. in, in public seminars, but learning how to build a brand and, and how to create content and and monetize that content. Tell us a little bit more about what you're doing today and who do you work with? Who are you helping? So the, I'm going to answer one piece of that first, which mm-hmm. is Brandy's formulaic. So the gentleman that I worked with back then, um, back in 2006, and I've worked with many since then, I mean, I made him very successful and he's not what I would say the most charismatic person on the planet. So, um, I kind of call it, I took a turd and made him a star and I've done it <laughs> over and over and over again with many clients that are way better than, you know, him. Um, but it's formulaic why people buy from people. It's H to H marketing. People buy from people, not brands. So how do you make a brand, a humanistic and a perspective? Of people purchase, even when that person's not there, right? So Tony Robbins is a big name. Robert Kiyosaki is another name. These are people that you may never meet, but you might buy because of them. Oprah's another one. So it's formulaic. Um, and so that's what I've been able to do over and over again. What I do now is I kind of move from the expertise realm into the influence realm. So I'll give you an example. Oprah is not an expert. She'll say it herself. I am not an expert. She's an influencer of a specific thing. She went down a, a road you know, uh, she made a complete direction pull back in the nineties, which is I'm going to be an influence of a particular niche, which let's call it spirituality for sake of conversation, Maureen Williamson and, and, um, uh, and go on and on names, Eckhart Tolle, they're experts in the field of that, Brene Brown, but she is an influencer that pulls them up. 
right? Mm. So who has more power? And Eckhart Tolle is an expert or Oprah is an influencer. So there's a shift. How do you move from expert to influencer? Yeah, and that's it, it's key. like the difference between knowing how to do it versus knowing who can do it. And then it's a question of who's got the biggest Rolodex, right? Yeah, there's definitely, yeah, absolutely. And and like, how do you get that Rolodex? You right. know, how do you tap into that Rolodex? How do you become an influencer? And I call the omnipresent effect, which um, is what I wrote to you guys about, which is how do you become omnipresent? And what the heck does that mean? Now, that's a term that Gary Vee's talked about. So I'm, I'm stealing from him for sure. But there is a formulaic about it, which I have tested myself. I mean, about a year, it's been about a year and a half, maybe a year, that I mean, I was behind the scenes. I'm a wizard behind the scenes. I built businesses behind the scenes over and over and over again. I wasn't the one who was in the front, really, and didn't really care to be in the front necessarily. So only a year ago did I take on this like, well, what would it be like to be an influencer or be omnipresent? Can I do it? As like a test. And um, I did kind of a formulaic presence on myself. And now I know it works because one, my traffic's gone way up, of course, and lists have gone up and revenue and stuff like that. But the real big test is when you go to a conference or you go somewhere and people go, God, I see you everywhere. <laughs> you know, like that to me is the litmus test, right? I'm like, really? Okay, cool. Like, boom, it's working. Yeah. Um, especially in this day and age, right? When things are just coming at you at a speed of light constantly. And I'm no Kim Kardashian, you know what I mean? And I'm no Oprah. But if I can do it with myself and I've done it with other people, it's like it's a formula that anybody can do. You know what I mean? Yeah, so that's, I, I think that's interesting. And it raises a question because a lot of people are saying, you know, it's all I can do just to keep up with uh, the day to day things that I've got to do. And they already feel kind of overwhelmed to begin with. How do they become omnipresent without getting burned out on, on the whole marketing <laughs> thing? Right. Oh, gosh. I don't know about that, about being burned out. That's something it's in, in individual, but as well, but it's a formula, right? It's a formula in the world of being omnipresent. And it's about being able to create content in one time and do it and look like you're everywhere all the time. So how I do that, how I teach, right, is the first step of the baseline is to, is podcasting. How do you do, use two hours a month, which could be 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. So four interviews. And then how do you take that and turn that into audio, video, and move that across all platforms? And I had called the IDOM effect, which is influencer domination master map. And how people can do in two hours a month, move the content all over the all over the map in the world of social media and whatnot. So that looks like they're everywhere all the time. Cause that's where influence comes from. And influence doesn't have to be a like guy, you know, influential in the space of podcasting and LinkedIn and social media, and that's fine. But some people be an influence in their industry, like um, restaurant business. Um, there's a there's a company I'm working with right now. They are in the stem cell world. They want to be very influential as a stem cell specialist. Like mm. perfect, you know. And these are great niches to tap into being specialists or being influencers because no one's really owned those fields yet, or you know, and even in financial space or in the um, restaurant space. You know, you can be an influence in the restaurant industry as well as the consumer side, right? So there's two types of influencing, right? So let's say it's a chef and they want to be known as an influencer in their industry to people inside their industry, right? Not outsiders, sure. okay? So there's two levels. There's like, well, I could be very influential in my field inside the industry itself. And I might not know who they are. You might never know them. And then there's like the people who are the, what's it called? Guy, I forgot his name, Guy, whatever. Um, he, he's an influence chef on the outside. That makes sense. So there's two levels of influence. It doesn't matter which one you choose, but whichever one you choose, learn to be omnipresent so that people are like, wow, you're everywhere all the time. Yeah, That's that the key. That's really encouraging to, to hear you say that there's a formula, number one. And secondly, that your formula only takes two hours a month, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I think um, I, we, we could probably find two hours a month if we're serious about our business and we really want to make a difference and make money. I think most of our listeners can find a way to carve out two hours a month to work on this. Yes. Yeah. And that's, you, you know, you're, you're on the radio, you get it, you're out here and it, it takes time to do shows, 
but they don't take as much time as people think. You know what I mean? So once right. you get the content, then you have it in a way where it's omnipresent. The other piece around content that I, and I know you, you already know this, but I'm just sharing for the listener is always make content. Always, always, always make content evergreen. Always, always, always. I, I believe in always evergreen Absolutely. content. So yeah. It's not summer. It's not Christmas. It's not 2016, 15, 18, or 19. And always, always, always stay away from politics. <laughs> 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 Those are my little like never, never again. Now, yeah. I screwed up in the past. So let be straight. <laughs> I'm a rebel. <laughs> totally mm-hmm. a rebel. Yeah. So back in 2016, if you go back to some of my podcasts, I went there with politics because it was just so loud. Um, but it was a mistake. That was a huge mistake. And I'll never do that again. I will never talk about politics ever again. Um, <laughs> I, think, yeah, like, I think there's mistake. a lot of people who have kind of taken that approach. But uh, then yeah. every so often they, they come back again. But one thing about politics is no matter where you are mm-hmm. in your in your politics, if you bring it into your business, you have just – alienated at least half yeah. of your audience, if not two thirds of your audience. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it's just not worth it. Right. Unless no. you're, unless you're a pundit, unless you are a political pundit for a living, right. like you just don't go there, yeah. you know, no matter what side you're on, no matter if you're on the East coast, or North coast, you live in, a, you know, you live in Canada, just like, don't go there. So I made that strong line and I'll never do that again. But the point of the content is when you make it evergreen, you know, it's not Christmas, it's not summer, it's not a particular year, you can really have content all the time. You know, yeah. uh, it's really important to do that. If you look at some, you know, I look at Gary Vee and some of the people that have just like even large amounts of content, Tony Robbins, you never know what in the world time of year it is or where they're really at unless they speak at some level. You know, they keep that content because we as human beings, right? It's all about human psychology. We as human beings, if we go on to, let's say the news cycle and we look at the news that says two days ago, well, Mm -hmm. it's old. That's where our brains, it's old, right? But in the world of education, you can learn something in digital marketing two months ago and it's not necessarily old yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. The cycle of marketing doesn't move that fast. Like right. the political, right? So we can share something that can be an education piece for a lifetime, especially in personal development, fitness, um, digital marketing. It doesn't move at the speed of light like that. Yeah. Some things so, are just timeless truths yeah. and, and evergreen okay. principles and, and, Boy, if if you could get those basics and those fundamentals down in the first place, that's probably better than chasing after the latest, greatest, flashy new thing that's in for three months or six months and then something changes. Uh, so if, if we're going to take the time to create the content, uh, then the content needs to be things that are going to create massive shifts in people's lives. And that brings us back to the to the principles uh, the the universal laws and, and the things that don't change and are timeless. And that's another way that we can extend our omnipresence without getting overwhelmed at trying to create something brand new every single time. A lot of the great speakers and teachers and influencers are basically they, they craft their message and they deliver that message over and over and over again. And then they give it different um, different positioning. But it's once you grasp the fundamentals, you just keep hammering away at those fundamentals. So then I think the the biggest uh, challenge is um, how do we know what to come up with? Great question. Um, So a couple things. One, um, I was just reading a a book, Jim Rohn, like he's timeless and he's no longer here on the planet, you know, in the world of his body, but timeless, you know, just timeless. Just Mm -hmm. love him. Uh, completely what a great uh, thought leader he was in his time and still today. So as far as content, there's a little, you know, there's a cup. I have, I have a video that I just did, just did about three tips on basically sparking content and I'll give you, let's see, I'll give you one. <laughs> I'll give you one on here. Cause it's just super easy. And as soon as I say it, you're like, Oh my God, really? <laughs> um, so there's this little thing called Facebook. Never heard of it. And you go to Facebook and let's say you do a niche on fitness because you know, why not? So if you are part of a group, I would get part of a group of three or four fitness groups. Okay. So you're inside the group and then the left-hand side of a group, there's this little tiny section. It's a, just an open bar. It's a search bar is what it is. Very people, few people use it. You can go to the left-hand side of the group and you type in, how do I, Mm. or how to, 
right? So this is where somebody in the group forever, I mean, the group could have been around five years, has typed in, how do I, I don't know, lose weight in five minutes or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how do I do this, whatever. So you, what happens is you're going back in time and looking at people's questions. Hmm. And so, boom, there's a content piece. Oh, someone's like, how do I, um, you know, lose weight on my treadmill? I don't know. And boom, now you're doing a three-minute video. How do you do this, this, this? I mean, you just answer the questions people are already asking. It's an old copyright technique, copywriting technique, which is answer the questions people already have in their mind. Well, how do you read minds? <laughs> well, <laughs> Facebook does it very well for us, and so does Google. But that's just one way to do it on Facebook, super easy, free way to just, just kind of get your brain started. What a great tip. And, and you know, the, the real thing that it, I think it's hard for people to grasp is that it's not about you coming up with something and trying to sound very smart. And it certainly no. is not about you trying to be original in the sense of trying to get real creative about the topics and the things that you come up with. All you have to do is do what Heather says, go to Facebook and search or Google or, or whatever search how do you, how do I, how to, and basically answer the questions that people are already asking. You don't have to figure out what the questions are, find out who's asking it, and then create your content around answering the question. Uh, that's a lot easier. And I think a lot less overwhelming than just sitting down with a blank piece of paper right. saying, okay, what's 10 things right. I should talk about? today. That's right. kind of hard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And it's not very rebellious. You know, it's not very sexy, but it's, <laughs> it's good. It's hacking Facebook. It's using Facebook for something positive in the world. Right. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I do. Facebook is just, a, that's one tip I do on my YouTube channel. I just did a video on three ways on uh, how to spark the content in your brain. And that was one of three. Hmm, I love that. Super, um, thanks. So when when we're talking about making money as an influencer, whenever, yeah. when I when I hear that, it sounds intriguing. Then I think about that that whole Instagram thing with the the uh, music festival and the the models oh, right. were paid. I just yeah. watched that. I just watched that on Netflix. My sister made me. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Wow. So fascinating. How, how do we how do we monetize our influence without being coming across as being uh, too salesy or, or too over the top. It is, mm -hmm. is, is there a balance that we can strike there? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a couple things. I mean, I'm a marketing person by trade and I did marketing class in university. And I think for sure the two case studies that will go down in history of marketing is that party, a uh, fire party, right? Fire yeah. party. Mm -hmm. um, and then Donald Trump, those two marketing case studies of influence, will go down in history. They'll probably be talked about for the next 100 years <laughs> of a human and uh, one person and a, an entire event that just, you know, influenced people. Yeah. So mainly from this thing called Twitter and this thing called Instagram and these thing, platforms called social media, right? Driving a particular narrative. And those are case studies, you can say good or bad, whatever your view is. The bottom line is it did, did drive human behavior. And it still does to this mm -hmm. day. So, um, with that said, influence is about, you know, it's about moving human behavior. So you can move human behavior for the good and the bad. It's still moving human behavior. Robert Cialdini, which is his book, Influence, I'm literally almost just talking exactly out of that book. Mm -hmm. And I did, again, my mistake, but I did do some videos back in 2016 and I put up Trump against that book, Influence. Um, again, there's somewhere on the internet you're welcome to find them because it's really good case studies. Um, however, he is doing the exact formula, okay, that Rival Cialdini lays out. Mm -hmm. And he wrote that book in the 80s, you know, because here's the deal, humans to humans, we haven't changed that much. Open That's the right. Bible, read the Bible, read Genesis, read John, Matthew, doesn't matter. Guess what? You'll understand it. You'll get it. Not like it or disagree. That's different. Mm -hmm. Like, disagree, don't whatever, belief. That's very different. Understand it, have a reaction. That's universal. Yeah. And that's what influence is. Right? It's the narrative. So, it, it's the stories that we tell and, and how we weave those stories and how we influence behavior and belief based on the stories that we tell. That's what it's all and about. Part of influence, I'll take off Trump for a second, but I'll take other people that are kind of um, 
in your face. Rebels, right? Rebel, definitely rebels. Yeah. Rush Limbaugh and Howard Stern. Mm-hmm. Two big rebels. One's obviously political, one's not. 50 to 52% of their listeners hate them. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ever, because I've done this, if you ever actually read the replies to Trump tweets, <laughs> they're really bad. <laughs> yeah. So I probably would say 60% of the people that read Trump tweets hate him. My point is, is that influence comes with both. Mm-hmm. Right? And good influencers, they're people that hate Oprah. Can you believe it? I know it's crazy, but they're people that don't like that girl, you know? <laughs> so very fewer. I think it's definitely less than 50%. However, there is a reaction to her. And to Trump and to Rush Limbaugh and to Howard Stern and to Kim Kardashian. People, some people hate Kim Kardashian. So the point is, is that it's a reaction. Some people don't like Jesus. Some people like Jesus. You know, I can go on and on of influences in in this world that, so you talked about how do we come across not sleazy in a particular way. I would say you got to let that go because people are going, if you're not loved or hated, then you're not influencing Mm, I love that. Yeah. And and it is. It, it's going to be both. If you really step up to the plate and, and really craft your message and hammer that narrative away, it's going to attract the ones that you want to attract. And by definition, it's going to repulse the people that you don't want to work with anyway. So that's pretty incredible when you think about it. We're not trying to reach everybody. We're trying to reach somebody. And so Some this people don't is, like Mother Teresa. I mean, yeah, really, I've, I seen mean, a, I've seen a narrative <laughs> that they don't like Mother Teresa. I mean, in the world, but you know, <laughs> it takes, it takes all kinds, like doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. It's just that's a point. Like you said, it, it it will attract or detract who you want, mm-hmm. and that's the key. And yeah. that comes from an old narrative that Dan Kennedy said a long time ago. If someone doesn't hate you, then you're not making it. You know, you're not making a difference. Yeah, I love <laughs> it's that. Just true. Heather, what are you working on right now that's got you really mm-hmm. excited that you'd like to share with our listeners? Thank you for asking. Um, about about six months ago-ish, I saw an article on entrepreneur.com that talked about the top 10 business um, masterminds for entrepreneurs. And I read it, and I knew pretty much every single entre- mastermind on there, and there was not one female. And it really bothered me because there's a huge amount of females that are in this coming into the entrepreneurship world every single day and are very successful. And so I kind of made a statement to myself and to the world that I'm going to be creating the largest premier online uh, premier mastermind that's built by women for everyone. Hmm. So it's called the power circle and it really is designed for online business owners that who are up to big things and making an impact in the world. And I don't care about gender, right? I really want to help people go to the next level in their messaging. And I just think that women do come from a different place. We see things differently. We feel things differently, just like Mars and Venus. And I want to be able to bring that impact um, into the world and take my 20 years experience of online marketing um, and help people grow. So that's what I'm really up to. It's called the power circle. Mm, I love that. And and I like the fact that you're not limiting it to just women, uh, you know, and, and that's fine if someone wants to niche into that. Uh, but um, I feel like I'm always missing something important whenever we've got a really gifted, talented, skilled, artful female who only works with females. I feel like I've been cheated. And yeah, I, well, I'm glad you said that. Some people always say you, you help females. I'm like, well, I, I help entrepreneurs. <laughs> I don't feel like I have to like put a gender on it. You know what I mean? yeah. And nowadays people don't have genders. So I, I don't put that kind of on it. Um, and I've been saying that for years and years and years. And, and just now are people getting that? Because when I do have a mastermind, I just had my first one, um, 70% were men. And they, because they loved the conversation, what we're up to, they were in alignment with that. It's not just females that are up to, you know, it's not a gender thing. It's an entrepreneur thing, but they do realize having a female leader has, has a different viewpoint, Hmm. you know, and it's not such a, it's not such a, in their words, a bro club. So they feel safe. They feel like they can be more vulnerable. They can feel like they can talk about what's really going on in their business. They don't feel like they have to kind of come with that. Everything's fine. You know, they feel like they can let go a little bit better and like, here's what's really going on. Here's what's behind the scenes, people. You know, so I feel like they can, they feel like they can kind of open up a little more and they can get a better help to go the next level of their business. How do our listeners find out more about, about that? 
Well, uh, my LinkedIn profile actually has everything about the premiere on, on my mastermind, uh, the Power Circle. Uh, the best way is really LinkedIn uh, and DM me there. And you can go to heatherhavenwood.com forward slash LinkedIn. It's really the best way. Or they can um, chat me up on Facebook direct and then go to askheatherann.com. And that goes right to me. Okay, perfect. And we'll have those links on the web on our website as well. Uh, right here underneath the the replay when it becomes available. Heather, this has been really educational, and I, I think you have helped us to see that this is possible. We we can do this. We got this at only you know two hours a month to start. Um, yeah. We can we can become omnipresent and create really valuable content. It's not hard. It's not difficult. There is a formula and there is a process to it. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Any final thoughts that you would like to leave us with? Yeah. So I'll just do a final thought, which is um, something that someone told me a long time ago. And he said, ask yourself this question before you do anything. Does it feed your confusion or strengthen your clarity? Mm. And I think when we come from that perspective, we can really have a, a better impact in the world. You might be passionate about it. You might be upset about something, but does that really going to add clarity to your life and other people's lives? And I think that's where impact is. Mm, I love it. Thanks. I've been speaking with Heather Ann Havenwood. She is the founder of Influencer Growth Formula. She's a top Amazon bookseller and author of the book Sexy Boss. She's a nationally syndicated radio host of the show Like a Boss, Insights with Influencers. And she was named by Huffington Post as top female entrepreneur to watch. You can find out more and connect with Heather at heatherhavenwood.com. Heather, it's been a real pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for being on Rebelpreneur Radio today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to Rebelpreneur Radio with Ralph Brogdon. Download the show notes and much more at rebelpreneur.com.